A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go towards the south to the road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go over to the chariot, to this chariot, and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, Do you understand what you are reading? He replied, How can I, unless someone guides me? He, and he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture he was, that he was reading was this, Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe this generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with the scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down to the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself in Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, 
and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been been perfected among us in this, that we may be we have, may have the boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. And whoever has fear has not reached perfect perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God made their love must love their brothers and sisters also. For the Lord. Thanks be to God. scriptures are so wonderful that I wish I could preach on them all. Don't worry. But that would be like two, a two-hour sermon, and perhaps that's a little much for y'all. You know, back in the day, some preachers would preach for a couple of hours, and everyone would go home and eat and come back for two more hours. 
15 minutes sounds pretty good now, doesn't it? <laughs> anyway, it's all about love, God's love. And in the Gospel and in John's letter and the passage in Acts contains a very important message to the church. The story in Acts has been told since these scriptures were first shared with the Jesus followers and who in turn shared these accounts around the world. Sometimes welcome and sometimes a little uncomfortable for the Christ followers then and now, 2,000 years later. How does God want Christians to bear witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ? The book of Acts is a good place to find out, given that it's the account of how the church first took form. This Ethiopian eunuch comes on the scene before we hear about Saul's big conversion on the road to Damascus. The Holy Spirit was active and wasn't waiting on Peter or Paul to get their acts together. No pun intended, their acts together. That was for you, Michael. <laughs> Philip, who was just called to be a deacon in last week's reading, has fled to Samaria with the other Jesus followers after the stoning of Stephen. These new deacons become the first evangelists to preach outside of Jerusalem and Judea. And isn't it interesting how the Holy Spirit works? They fled to Samaria. If you recall some of Jesus' parables, you'll also recall that Samaritans and Jews didn't really get along. Samaria was occupied by people with a history of ethnic religious conflict with Jerusalem-oriented Jews. The apostles were there not because they wanted to be, but because it was where God's love was compelling them to go. Philip was pretty successful in Samaria with many listening to his message and being baptized. But who is this eunuch? Why is he included in the early accounts of the emerging church? Why is this interaction between the eunuch and Philip important? This eunuch represents the intersectionality of all God's beloved. The eunuch is a seeker, hungry for God and responding to the scriptures which are speaking to his heart. But the eunuch doesn't fit in. The eunuch messes with our boundaries and binary understanding of what is free, enslaved, whole, mutilated, pure, impure, potent, impotent, male, female, native, foreigner. The eunuch isn't easily any of those binary definitions. But also, this eunuch was a wealthy black African from Ethiopia, educated and able to read in Greek, devout enough to study the prophet Isaiah, and also humble enough to know that he can't really understand what he's reading without guidance. With a questionable religious, ethnic, and gender identity, we're not sure he was even allowed to worship in the temple although he'd gone to Jerusalem to do that, he must have heard the scriptures read somehow because he was curious about what it meant. Now, the Spirit led Philip to go over to the chariot. Without pause, Philip literally chases down the carriage, breaking down the boundaries of ethnicity, class, and social status. You just don't charge the chariot of a high court official. He had no idea who was in that chariot. But for a modern parallel, imagine a black wealthy diplomat in Washington, D.C. inviting a street preacher to join him in his late model Lexus for a little Bible study. <laughs> Philip asks a pretty direct question. Do you understand what you're reading? That is Philip's core mission, the reason the Spirit directed him to the chariot in the first place. Philip doesn't ask the eunuch about any of his identities, 
race, gender, class, none of that is relevant. The eunuch is not screened to see if he's worthy. Philip is only concerned with explaining the passage of Isaiah to him that connects to the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what matters. And none of those identities get in the way of the question, do you know what you're seeking to know by reading? That's a good question for all of us. Do we know what we are seeking when we read the scriptures? We can see why this passage from Isaiah may have been spoken, may have spoken deeply to this eunuch who remains unnamed. It becomes intensely personal for him. Whatever privileges he has gained in the court of the Candace, he remains stigmatized in both Gentile and Jewish society, not belonging anywhere because of who he is. It's a passage about a shorn, scorned, shamed, sheep-like figure to whom justice and generation were denied. About whom is the prophet talking, the eunuch wants to know. He's a threat to normal society, and he remains cut off from any hope of being a part of a covenant community, according to Deuteronomy. Unless Isaiah is offering him hope, and unless there's a path to a more positive outcome for a stigmatized sheep. Philip could have used the law in Deuteronomy to justify excluding this eunuch, but Philip listened to the Spirit's guidance, although it did not probably make much sense to him at first. He showed up at the right time for this eunuch. Philip started with the scripture from Isaiah that the eunuch was asking about and proclaimed the good news of Jesus Christ to him connecting the unjustly crucified Jesus with Isaiah's innocent slain figure. Injustice was something the eunuch could relate to. Jesus suffered unjustly and can stand with the victims of violence and stigmatization, like Isaiah's slaughtered lamb, like an Ethiopian eunuch. This message is a message of love, a message of liberation from oppression, and the unit gets it. He sees the water and cries out, what is to prevent me from being baptized? What a profound question that echoes down the ages to us sitting here today. Think for a minute of those who feel unwelcome in the church, unworthy to be loved by God. What prevents them from being baptized into the body of Christ? Heaven forbid if it is us. When the barriers to true fellowship and being welcomed into the body of Christ as Christ's own forever are broken down, nothing prevents Philip and the eunuch from entering the water and together becoming full members, siblings, in God's family. You see, we are still in the Easter season, and we are being reminded of the purpose of Jesus' death and resurrection, why Jesus saw it through to the end. The unit. Jesus' resurrection and exaltation opened the way for all who suffer, eunuchs, foreigners, outcasts, all of us, to be in the household of God. For God so loved the world, all of us. I believe Luke made sure this story was not forgotten when he wrote the book of Acts, the scripture that tells us about how the Jesus movement flourished and grew through the works of the disciples. When we listen to the Spirit, we aren't to become barriers to others hearing the good news and coming to know that they too belong to Christ. 
We are to become ambassadors for Christ like Philip and respond in humble obedience to helping others find their way home to God. We are not to deny anyone. We do not let social outcasts stand outside the door knocking. We open the door for them and welcome them into our covenant community. It was frowned on in Philip's day, and it's often frowned on in our day. But we are Easter people. We are about hope and resurrection and life for all. We are to follow Philip's example of living God's love in the world by being humble enough to listen to the guidance of the Spirit, which may take us into unfamiliar territory, which may ask us to sit with folks whom we don't really understand. But our job is to be faithful to a gospel of love and acceptance, not to police or judge who is in or out. Christ came to knock down those barriers. And we spend far too much energy and time on trying to resurrect walls rather than build a bigger table so all can have a seat at the table of our covenant community. So, let us, in the example of Philip as Easter people, be able to boldly claim for all, Alleluia! Christ is risen! The Lord is risen indeed! Alleluia! Amen.